But that's not enough. What I've just shown you are examples of the very simple and straightforward ways that journalists and food supplement pill peddlers and naturopaths can distort evidence for their own purposes. What I find really fascinating is that the pharmaceutical industry use exactly the same kinds of tricks and devices, but slightly more sophisticated versions of them in order to distort the evidence that they give to doctors and patients in which we use to make vitally important decisions. So, firstly, trials against placebo. Everybody thinks they know that a trial should be a comparison of your new drug against placebo, but actually, in a lot of situations, that's wrong, because often we already have a very good treatment that is currently available, so we don't want to know that your alternative new treatment is better than nothing. We want to know that it's better than the best currently available treatment that we have. And yet, repeatedly, you consistently see people doing trials still against placebo, and you can get license to bring your drug to market with only data showing that it's better than nothing, which is useless for a doctor like me trying to make a decision. But that's not the only way that you can rig your data. You can also rig your data by making the thing that you compare your new drug against really rubbish. You can give the competing drug in too low a dose so that people aren't properly treated. You can give the competing drug in too high a dose so that people get side effects. And this is exactly what happened with antipsychotic medication for schizophrenia. 20 years ago, a new generation of antipsychotic drugs were brought in, and the promise was that they would have fewer side effects. So people set about doing trials of these new drugs against the old drugs, but they gave the old drugs in ridiculously high doses, 20 milligrams a day of haloperidol. And it's a foregone conclusion if you give a, a drug at that higher dose that it will have more side effects and that your new drug will look better. 10 years ago, history repeated itself, interestingly, when risperidone, which was the first of the new generation antipsychotic drugs, came off copyright, so anybody could make copies. Everybody wanted to show that their drug was better than risperidone, so you see a bunch of trials comparing new antipsychotic drugs against risperidone at 8 milligrams a day. Again, not an insane dose, not an illegal dose, but very much at the high end of normal, and so you're bound to make your new drug look better. And so it's no surprise that overall, industry-funded trials are four times more likely to give a positive result than independently sponsored trials. But, and it's a big but, <laughs> it turns out when you look at the methods used by industry-funded trials that they're actually better than independently sponsored trials. And yet they always manage to get the result that they want. So how does this work? <laughs> How can we explain this strange phenomenon? Well, it turns out that what happens is the negative data goes missing in action. It's withheld from doctors and patients. And this is the most important aspect of the whole story. It's at the top of the pyramid of evidence. We need to have all of the data on a particular treatment to know whether or not it really is effective. And there are two different ways that you can spot whether some data has gone missing in action. You can use statistics or you can use stories. I personally prefer statistics, so that's what I'm going to do first. This is something called a funnel plot. And a funnel plot is a very clever way of spotting if small negative trials have disappeared, have gone missing in action. So this is a graph of all of the trials that have been done on a particular treatment. And as you go up towards the top of the graph, what you see is each dot is a trial. And as you go up to the top, those are the bigger trials, so they've got less error in them. So they're less likely to be randomly false positives, randomly false negatives. So they all cluster together. The big trials are closer to the true answer. Then, as you go further down at the bottom, what you can see is over on this side, spurious false negatives, and over on this side, the spurious false positives. If there is publication bias, if small negative trials have gone missing in action, you can see it on one of these graphs. So you can see here that the small negative trials that should be on the bottom left have disappeared. This is a graph demonstrating the presence of publication bias in studies of publication bias, and I think that's the funniest epidemiology joke that you will <laughs> ever hear. That's how you can prove it statistically. But what about stories? Well, they're heinous. They really are. This is a drug called Reboxetine, and this is a drug which I myself have prescribed to patients. And I'm a very nerdy doctor. I hope I go out of my way to try and read and understand all the literature I read. The trials on this, they were all positive. They were all well conducted. I found no flaw. Unfortunately, it turned out that many of these trials were withheld. In fact, 76% of all of the trials that were done on this drug were withheld from doctors and patients. Now, if you think about it, if I toss a coin 100 times, and I'm allowed to withhold from you the answers half the times, then I can convince you that I have a coin with two heads, OK? If we remove half of the data, we can never know what the true effect size of these medicines is. And this is not an isolated story. Around half of all of the trial data on antidepressants has been withheld, but it goes way beyond that. The Nordic Cochrane Group were trying to get hold of the data on that to bring it all together. The Cochrane Groups are an international non-profit collaboration that produce systematic reviews of all of the data that has ever been shown. And they need to have access to all of the trial data. But the companies withheld.